Okay. And that's, and that's what we're super glad to have. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this school committee meeting on Tuesday, November 1st, 2022. Uh, if you all stand with me, we will say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bryant. With that, we do want to welcome all our guests today. Uh, thank you for joining us. Again, if there are topics today that you wish to speak on, um, we'll have this sign in here and we can uh, acknowledge you. We are having some internet issues as far as being able to uh, push this out live today. So this particular meeting will be videotaped and then it will be aired again later. So uh, our, our challenge is with that, but hopefully we'll get that going soon. So thank you for all working on that diligently. Um, any adjustments to the agenda? There are none. Uh, we have a communications. Sure. Um, so in your packet that Natalie, well, it's in front of you that I sent to you earlier, is a letter from OSD. So the Operational Services Division are the folks that set the tuition rates for our special education private placement. So any state-approved um, special ed private placement goes through OSD for their setting of their rates for the upcoming year. Um, you can see there that OSD is projecting or proposing a 14% increase for their rates for next year. So. I'm just going to share with you this handy little chart I made you. Um, sorry that I didn't put it in the packet. Um, but historically, the OSD inflation rates have hovered between 1% and 2%. So the 13-year average is 1.83%. So a, a, the FY24 proposed increase of 14% is a very large number. Um, just give you a couple of little tidbits of information down the bottom. So just in, as far as inflation factors in general, in the Chapter 7D funding formula, inflation is capped at 4.5%. So some of the conversation associated with this memo that came out from OSD was about holding sped private schools to the same inflation cap as the Chapter 70 formula does. Just to put it in parameters a little bit for us, we have at the bottom there, you can see our FY23 tuitions are just about $3 million. Two million of that is pre private placements as opposed to collaboratives. So those would be the increases. Usually in a given year, we'd budget about thirty dollars or $40,000 for the, the percentage increase for inflation. If they held it at the Chapter 70 funding cap, it would be a $92,000 increase, but a 14% increase is just under $300,000. Wow. Um, those are huge numbers. Those are numbers that will break your budget. Um, again, obviously, there's we've talked extensively about circuit breaker and how that works. Any circuit breaker reimbursement for the increase in tuitions, you wouldn't get until FY25 because it's one year out. There's a larger conversation about the fact that the circuit breaker reimbursement can't, comes from the same pot of money as some of the private school dollars. So it's the same pot of money you'd be tapping. So there's conversation about the circuit breaker also not being um, reimbursed at 75% moving forward. Um, so there is a call for advocacy and a call to action. So there is a sample letter um, floating out there for superintendents to put together and send out. Um, so obviously I will do that on behalf of us. I believe there's also one floating out on the MASC website for school committees to put together. Um, if that is something you guys are interested in taking a look at, I'm happy to draft it and bring it to you um, for the next meeting in October. I mean, in November, there's still time. Quick, uh, this has been something we've put in front of the state re uh, legislators over the past probably 10 plus years because this the 14 percent proposed does not mean that everybody's going to come in at only a 14 percent increase um, so what we've asked them to file legislation is to cap the amount that a provider can increase to that amount um, you know we actually asked before if they could cap it to the same level of chapter 70 increases um, to at least tie it to some type of, of um, benchmark. So I, it's definitely worth beyond the letter going to Representative Cutler and Senator Moran to say when you do when you get into the into the budget discussions because I believe they're both on ways and means or at least Representative Cutler is to at least make them aware that they, they need to to do something legislatively for the outliers because 14% is not your 
ceiling, it's more of a floor now. Right, and so part of the driver for the 14% is a 9% workforce stability factor that they're using. Um, and so if you get, if you dive really deep into the weeds of this, you can see that a lot of private schools for the past few years have received a lot of outside grant funding in order to keep themselves afloat during kind of our, our tough COVID years. At the same time, they've also been offering employees signing bonuses of $10,000. Um, so again, not something we offer here in public education, but now the workforce adjustment factor is driving up what their base salary expenses are. Um, so again, all, all part, all, those are all part of the letter that superintendents have been asked to draft, as well as um, on the MASC list serve for school committees. Aaron, pardon my ignorance here, but it's, it's proposed. Who are they proposing? It is actually it's, already approved. It's already said. It's already gone through, right? Okay. All right. So that's. This is going to happen. This isn't a proposal. It's already been approved, um, but obviously it has to find its way into the budget documents for FY24 in some way, shape, or form. Is there any CARES money or any of that stuff that we could tap into? No, so or? We, have our, we have our SPED stabilization fund that we started um, two years ago. I don't think of this as something that I would want to tap into this for. This is a, a budget issue that's going to affect every community, every every city, right. every town. This is the time where you have some bandwidth to make something happen, right? A one-off move-in that we're trying to budget for at the last minute, that's what that's been stabilization for. That's a budget hit just for us, and we're kind of in that alone for the, that period of time. Right. This is something where you can create some kind of groundswell support and hopefully make a change um, to what's being proposed or what, what has been approved for FY24. At first glance, it means two other things. Is number one, you won't be putting any more money in st sped stabilization Correct. next year because you're going to need to use it to balance the budget. Right. And the second is there may be a need to be more aggressive on taking some circuit breaker money at least for a year to to make to float. Right? Yeah, to make float. the one to try to make a uh, what is going to be a perpetual problem into at least a two-year problem by by absorbing some of it with the um, not additional but in stable is in um, set bed circle but it happens to be there the, the problem is and Aaron hit it I don't think just everybody's clear on it more people are going to be eligible the following year for sped stabilization I'm sorry for sped circuit breaker so that's going to make the money for 75 percent reimbursement could drop below that um, and you, you could get the same amount of money but you're going to get a lower reimbursement rate that's where some that's where the problem compounds so and Aaron mm -hmm. to help again forgive my ignorance but this is a proposed for this year 14 percent and that's not to say they couldn't come back with additional double digit figures next so year. the OSD rate increase of 14 percent has been approved for FY24 so they have they hold a separate kind of it, it's almost an entirely separate process to the state budgeting process they're okay. like a they hold hearings and whatnot, uh, but they do, they have an obligation to notify us a year in advance of a rate increase, which is why everyone got the same memo on October 1st saying that it was 14%. There was no um, conversation before that or an opportunity. Usually if an individual school, so it, um, in your packet you had a list of kind of what the individual schools are mm -hmm. that OSD covers. If an individual school is looking for a rate increase, we get a letter telling us that they're that they're seeking a rate increase and we're asked if there's any feedback we'd like to provide. There's a hearing that we're allowed to attend. As far as OSD as a whole, with the 14% rate, rate increase, that's not the process that's followed. They just file the rate increase. We're notified of it on October 1st so that you can plan accordingly. So I guess I'm still not sure I'm, I'm asking the question right. So we could see the next year? It will continue to go up. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So yes. this, this is, okay. And so are you, so you're proposing that we write a letter, or a letter of advocacy to, you know, Right, so it goes to your, your elected officials. Um, you know, they're also, MASS and MASC are asking us to supply some just district-specific information about, you know, what does this increase mean dollar-wise for our districts so that they can create um, kind of a letter on everyone's behalf as a whole. But they are asking that individual districts reach, reach out to their representatives and say, here's what this means for my district. Here's, you know, do you know anything about this? Do you know how they got to this? Do you understand the workplace adjustment factor? Do you understand the inflation inflation caps? Just to kind of get the conversation going. Okay. Yeah, so. I definitely think we should do that. Yeah, <laughs> and I think we're in support of you okay. drawing yes. something up and then also working with our government liaison to reach out to our representatives to do that as well. Okay. Can we need to formalize that? Do we need a motion or no? 
No, because I'm going to draft it and have you guys approve it at the okay. end. Okay. The one from you. I'll send the one from me. I don't need no, That's just from the superintendent's part. Uh, okay. Bill schedule uh, has been approved there. And then um, I will consider a motion to approve the school committee minutes of October 18th, 2022. So moved. Seconded. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion on the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstain? The ayes have it. Thank you. So in your packets, you all, I think I resent you the school improvement plans that we had taken a look at on October 18th as a first read. Um, I've invited the principals here tonight. Principal Talbot is actually um, at awake and is unable to join us this evening. Uh, but the other principals are here just to highlight one, one item in their school improvement plan that they're excited about. Just a reminder that school improvement plans are a document that really lives outside of this this group. It's really a, a living, breathing document for the school and the school community to talk about what their focus areas are and what they're looking um, to improve and to measure over the course of the year. So as you see, it's worded on the agenda as a second read and acceptance. You don't approve them. You're just accepting them. So whoever wants to start may start. <laughs> right. Just make sure you're talking to me. <laughs> talk into it I'm not going to take it off the stand. all right um, so I wanted to highlight um, under the communication area um, so I think it's a big transition going from elementary school to middle school and I think sometimes we make a lot I make a lot of assumptions about really understanding the new the new system so so many good things happen at the middle school and I think that this year I'm really focused on trying to make sure that I'm documenting that and pushing that out to families so that they really understand kind of more comprehensively um, the things we're doing at the middle school. Um, one of the things that's happening right now is most students take a service learning um, elective for a term, one out of the four terms. So kids that took it the first term now have just finished identifying um, and researching a community issue and now they're doing a service learning project. So we've had some grounds clean up. We have students collecting water bottles to show what a pound of plastic in the ocean is. Um, we have a lot of students talking about animal abuse. Um, so I've been trying to push that out so students kind of get the sense of how important their work is doing and giving them a sense of autonomy and leadership and communication. We also have student announcers sign up for weekly. Um, and that's been really great. So we have two a week have been coming and they've been really excited and then um, back to the service learning I said to some of the students if you want to announce pieces of your service learning um, you can actually add that in so now we've had some seventh graders and the eighth graders like have the you know things they read and they wait for the seventh graders to like then announce their service learning so just trying to be really proactive in my communication uh, for families any questions about what's going on in the middle school it's great. I do get to see those as I have a middle schooler, and uh, those are great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so something we are so, um, excited about at North is under our social and emotional learning goal, um, our community meetings changes. So um, every year we have community meetings in the past. Sit and we talk to the students about the different character traits that we focus on throughout the year. Um, in the past, we've done a student of the month award, so the teacher will nominate a student that's gone above and beyond for whatever character trait we focus on that month. So, you know, responsibility, respect, fairness. Um, but we try to think of a way to make it more inclusive because while it was good intention, we were finding that students were getting left out who were trying really hard or, um, you know, the same student getting the award year after year. So we've kind of moved our community meetings instead of being to grade level to celebrate community. We're doing a whole school community meeting once a month. Um, instead of focusing on one character trait, we're kind of focusing on all of them at the same time. So the teachers will do individual lessons throughout um, their day in their classrooms, but we also um, will do some of that character education at these community meetings. And to be more inclusive, we came up with these Titan tickets. Um, so every person in our school community has a packet of these and it lists all of those character traits that we work on throughout the year. So this is our way of kind of catching kids in the act. So, you know, every student in the class could get one of these on a daily basis. So we're able to recognize more students for the positive things they're doing. Um, you know, they're all working so hard. It's nice to have that. So what happens is 
like let's say I saw a student do something really nice in the hallway, like picked up a book that another student dropped, I would check off, wow, that was so caring, and I would give them this ticket. Um, and this is not just their teacher, it could be me, it could be someone that works in the cafeteria, it could be a custodian, it can be any adult. Um, so I would check off caring, write the student's name and grade, and then this bottom part tears off, so we have um, boxes in each one of the classrooms that the kids can put their name in, and we do a drawing at the community meeting, and that's just a way that we can recognize them. We have a pool of prizes, whether that's you know, Pembroke swag, water bottles, t-shirts, um, or like lunch with the principal, maybe you get to sit with um, you know, the varsity team at a basketball game, just ways to um, get the kids excited. They are absolutely loving this. The kids um, are having so much fun. They're running up to me in the hallway showing me their tickets. They can take the ticket home to show their parents. I've heard a lot of people have them on their fridge. So, um, And when we do draw their name, we are recognizing them in front of the whole school. We had the art classes make a big, um, they're like cut out letters that we have by the gym and it spells the word kind with the I missing. So the student would stand in for the I, for being the I in kind, and then we're putting that on social media. So um, they are super excited about that. And then to celebrate community, we're also trying to get community members in to speak to the students at these. So for example, next month, um, we're focusing on being thankful with it being Thanksgiving and all of that. So we are doing um, a food pantry drive and we're working on getting um, someone from the food pantry to come and talk to the kids about that work and how it benefits the community. So um, it's really just been an awesome thing to watch um, and we're hoping that the kids have more fun with it. So. Hey. <laughs> Mike, are you gonna be last? He, he is, is. he's Ooh. last. Maybe we won't even story. let him speak. <laughs> um, so we, as, just so you know, as elementary principals, we sort of each picked one that we're all doing in our own way. So Erica was focusing on the celebrating community so that you knew that's something all of us are focusing on. I'm going to talk about the reading stuff, um, which is just as exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it actually kind of is. So. Um, our goal, the I think what we've realized from the pandemic is the impact of the interrupted learning was a big hit on early literacy. So we've been working over the past two years with our K-2 staff on really taking a look at what we're doing programmatically and consistently across the buildings. So from that work, um, Jess and Mary Beth were able to get us um, PD this year with Crafting Minds on the Science of Reading. So the Science of Reading is this, it's sort of a phenomenon about how students need to learn reading. It's sort of a new science behind all how it works in your brain. So we are front loading that PD <coughs> this year with our staff so that we can make um, programmatic decisions in the future on what we're doing to make sure we're doing what's best for those kids. So we've already started Hegarty program, which focuses on phonemic awareness, K-2. We're having the PD. We have reading specialists at each building now, which we're able to implement um, the Dibbles assessment. It's not, it's a diagnostic. It's a screener. It's a screener. Not an assessment. Every, every synonym for what there I'm you talking. go. <laughs> <laughs> but it is not an assessment. It is a screener. So basically, they we called it the SWAT style. They went into every elementary school and did all of the assessing K to three themselves, so that it was consistent across the buildings. They were able to take that data, put it into slideshows for the every grade. We know what there's four levels, so you're, it's red, yellow, green, and blue. So we know who's in each zone for each subtopic area. It really targets and be, allows them to individualize the instruction. So they were able to form their groups. We were able to use that data to support our interrupted learning tutors and the work they're gonna do. So hopefully with all of these resources and programs and just new expertise and knowledge, we'll really be able to kind of target those gaps that we're seeing at early literacy to just have that all trickle through. Questions about the, uh, the literacy? It's great. That's awesome. We know uh, a lot of challenges there, and it's great to see we've been proactive to really try to make an impact there. So thank you for sharing. Last but not least. <clears throat> 
I'll just echo what Jen just was talking about. Um, the three of us in the elementary school are all doing very similar work, and we're really just trying to highlight you know, what that looks like in one building, which is really important. Um, so I remember coming to the school committee um, winter slash and advocating on behalf of the need for for the kiddos in, in the schools. No, when we when we, uh, when we talked to you about it, um, we sold it as a program that would really impact not just special education students, but also general So I'm happy to come back with just some preliminary information on that. Um, we think we're asking for a therapeutic resource. Program. And you've seen staff that acquired a lot of these things and we allowed us to provide um, support for each of our buildings. By the way, um, so, we've done a lot of work over the summer and also this school year on making sure it's going to be done. So, we created a data sheet um, that is um, exactly the same as the others, but it's the same data. Um, and we've already actually had a lot of input um, on those forms. We're using Google Forms. Um, so it gives us some nice colored spreadsheets and some nice bar graphs and all that kind of stuff. That it's, it's a good visual to understand where we're at. Um, so. What I'd like to um, just say is that the mental health staff over the past um, three early release days since the beginning of school have gotten together, building administrators have come as well um, to support that endeavor. And what we're looking at right now um, is common language. Um, named our Titan Lab. Got a <laughs> in the lab. need a name that really kind of fits the program, um, something that has no stigma attached to it. Um, kids are generally very happy to go there. And some of the things that we're finding right now are that kids are utilizing this resource um, as it was intended. Like they're going there for short intervals of time, getting what they need to be able to return to class. And that's exactly what it was set up to do. And we have the data to support that. So at our last professional development, um, just a couple of weeks ago, we had talked about um, some similarity. Some of that initial visual right now. And it is coming to try and say, we're seeing right now, the answer goes to the right now, about 10 to 20 minutes in the time, the majority of our kids uh, are utilizing um, the Titan Lab. The other piece that's really, really nice is um, we've also identified that that work is not necessarily happening outside of the classroom. That the support person has been able to go inside classroom and provide that support as well. So it might mean that sitting with the child to make them feel more comfortable, um, whether it's math class or history, whatever is going on, um, to be able to support them. So that's just some initial data. And I know that you've asked for an updated social emotional update later on in November. And I'm working with Jess on providing her with some of those data points as well. So we're really excited and it's, we're off to a great start. Any questions? Oh, I mean, I think all, it's, it's nice, you know, I'm fairly new on the committee, so it's really nice to see all this stuff come to fruition. It's really nice to hear about it, so thank you so much. It sounds great. Can you talk to what the interaction is in that 10 to 20 minute interval? What does it look like? Yeah, it might, it's all communication, right? So it's really finding that, that, that person, that really, that, that child is really So um, we've all three of us found people in our buildings. Um, that really kind of embrace that. So it's making connections between the first two weeks, um, making sure that those people that came to the general education classrooms introduced themselves, made some really good connections. They had played some games with the kids. Uh, and so what we end up doing is it's a lot of listening. It's a lot of listening. What are you feeling like? And then using some of the strategies um, in conjunction with our mental health staff to be able to support kids um, with whatever they're kind of dealing with. And it's not just, you know, pandemic related issues. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. So, question. Um, when there are multiple students who need to go in there at the same time, hmm. what's what does it look like, right? Because you can't, you can't well, I guess you are prioritizing in some cases, but what what happens? Yeah. We thought about that as well over the summer. Switching me over, huh? We thought about that as you know as a possible need as well, and that has happened on a couple of occasions. Um, so the beauty of it is um, we've actually uh, have our mental health staff um, in tandem, working in tandem with our paraprofessional. Um, so a lot of times um, our social workers may be taking a student into one section of the room or maybe down to his or her office and working with them um, while the other paraprofessionals may be working there. Um, sometimes it's the principal and the system principal in there as well. So it's kind of a, a whole team approach. Last question. Mm -hmm. Because 
it could be like one time, a kid comes in one time, something bad happened, right? But the ones that are uh, repeat yes. attendees, what's what's the plan for them in school, and what's the plan for communication? Sorry, plan for communication uh, home. Yeah. And what's really, you know, impressive right now is the data that we are taking. Um, it allows us to say, you know, have those weekly phone calls with with the parents and say, look, um, your child is actually utilizing the Titan Lab actually three times this week, and it was only for you know 20 minutes at a time. Um, we should be really happy about it. It's facilitating facilitating some communication that may not have been there in the past. Um, so we're, we're happy to see that piece of it. Um, and you know, um, I'm sorry, the other second part of your question. Yeah, I just so I was asking when you have multiple times yes right what's communication to the family but then also what's the what's the path right because because at some point it, symptoms start to correct continue on what's the ultimate yeah what would be what I mean, it might be too early but what are you thinking is the next step well the next steps would be a lot of those kiddos that are coming into us um, with that level of need um, a lot of times have um, individual behavior plans. So some of that data that we're looking at right now is actually informing that, that those data yeah. plans. Um, so those professionals that we're working with who update those behavior plans, you know, have all that data right there at their disposal and they're updating them as such and then getting feedback from the family as well. So they know exactly what's been going on. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Mike, kind of to build on Mike's question, yep. um, you're talking about the data. Will you be able to put together um, like, like trends for life? I, yeah. I always go back to my insurance of trend analysis, but I'm, Absolutely. I'm, you know, I'm, I'd be interested to see as, you know, I would think initially as you roll this out, you're going to see an increase in participation as the comfort levels grow. Yes. But my hope would be that as those comfort levels and those interactions continue, that we might see that cap and then trend back down from the benefits of doing something like this. Are you going to be able to put together things that you know, we would be able to see, say, at year end, so we could kind of gauge the success? Absolutely. Program? And I think we're doing that work right now. We are actually sent it to, we actually identified the two trends that I just spoke about. Um, and I think it would be very easy to do, and even on like almost a trimester schedule to see actually, you know, the successes that we're having with kids. And I could definitely come back and bring you that information by the end of the year. I'd, I'd like to yeah? see it in the, to just so that from year to year, we can we can also measure this, this, the overall success and trends and see where we're heading, and and maybe where we need to expand or, um, you know, as things change, just worldwide Absolutely. and the issues that our, our students are facing, we can shift with it. So, great. Thank Absolutely. you. Sure. No problem. Thank you. Thank you guys. And I know we are going to get in depth on this a little bit more <coughs> coming up, so we'll continue to look forward to seeing where that data comes. So with that, um, I will accept a motion to accept the 2022-23 school improvement plans. So moved. Second. second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstain? The ayes have it. Thank you. And thank you all for yes, your sharing. The day after Halloween is quite draining on the elementary and middle school. <laughs> and so you guys can go. If you like to bring candy, please. <laughs> <laughs> bring it to the kids. Give it to the kids. <laughs> so the next thing in your packet under my report um, is a consideration for approval of the new self-administration medication form. So in your packet um, is a copy of the form. This is um, a form exists now. Uh, so this is not a new form. This is just an updated form for the school nurses. The form that exists now is a little bit more narrative in nature as opposed to kind of check box. Um, and the reason why I'm bringing it to you is because the form is referenced in policy JLCD. Um, which is the uh, dissemination of medication. So self-administration is one of those. Obviously, self-administration is only for high school students. There's a whole host of criteria they need to be able to meet, um, as you can read from the bottom, um, in order to be able to self-administer an EpiPen or, or whatnot. So. Doesn't the policy also say, yeah, it says what they, what is it acceptable? So it doesn't. So the original um, self-medication form talks about inhaler, EpiPen, auto-injector, or insulin, or any other medication prescribed by a licensed physician, so. Okay, yeah. so it's, it is relatively specific. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I thought, I thought it, because I just remember when we had right, that. Right, so your student can't be walking around with Benadryl, or correct. it has to be. Because we talked about, I think, yeah. the conversation, and then that has been on for a while, or at least the initial was on for a while. We talked about it, things such as Advil mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, I just wanted, I brought it up only because, just so people were aware what some of the past was on it. 
So the form itself isn't part of the policy, it's just referenced in the policy. So. And this form is? It lives on the high school website under the health services tab. But there's no changes to this? Well, so the, the current form that we have is just a little bit longer. Okay. Um, it starts just with a narrative about what, what self-administration is. This is just a one-page streamlined form, um, but it, it covers the same thing. So the check boxes now are a little bit, there's a few more currently, but they're, they condense them into it. Will this be pushed out through the registration process at the start of the year if this gets? So this is usually a conversation with the family and the nurse specifically. Okay. Yeah. Right. Not something that we would just no. put out there for everybody no. to complete. Okay. No. Any other questions for Aaron or leadership on this? All right. Do I have a motion to accept the new itself administration medical medication form? So moved. We have a motion. So is did this, uh, this come for the first read already? No, this is just a form. It's not just in the form, policy. Just a form, so it's not the policy. Yeah, Got it. Yeah, okay. no, we're not changing the policy at Got all. It. So we have a motion. I'll second. Oh. So we'll <coughs> and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstain? The ayes have it. Thank you. So the last thing under my report is a, a, bask, a waiver for girls basketball. So the high school athletic department is seeking an MIAA waiver to allow eighth grade girls to play on the JV basketball team. Um, so they had their interest meeting, I think two weeks ago at this point, and there was about 20 girls or so that were interested in playing basketball at Pembroke High School. That's not a comfortable number for a varsity and a JV team. They're looking for, you know, three, four, maybe even five more students in order. Um, over the course of the season, there's injury and illness and, and whatnot. Um, last year, they were looking for a waiver for freshmen, for eighth graders to play freshman girls volleyball. We didn't move that forward in the sense yeah, that it's not our, our, I mean basketball, sorry. Um, you know, we're not looking, we're not necessarily looking to field freshman teams, but we'd really like to keep the, the varsity okay. and the JV going. Um, had a preliminary conversation with the folks at youth basketball just around what their eighth grade numbers look like for girls because our intent is not to kill that program. My understanding is that 15 girls are interested in travel basketball at the eighth grade level. Um, so if we were to use a few of them at the high school, they would still be able to field at one eighth grade girls team. So um, I did talk with the girls side, so I'm also representing yeah. that side of it. Look at you. Um, there's <laughs> currently nine girls signed up for the eighth grade team. <gasps> Three from East Bridgewater that will join them because they don't have a program. Um, they are prepared to support this. Um, I talked with uh, coach and so whatever we decide today, they will support. They're prepared to send out communication and, and start that process going. So they're in support of this because they want opportunities. Again, we're trying to, youth programs are there to build up towards the high school and, and they're there to support that program, so. Thanks for doing that, Liz. Yeah. And you did. I didn't do much. Just along for the ride, too. <laughs> so, all right, so they, I'm just trying to understand. So we, we only have a small amount of people at the... We have 20 girls at the high school that are interested in playing basketball. Um, 25 is usually... So we did it last year with 21, and there were a few times we weren't able to play the JV game because we didn't have enough girls okay. between the two teams. So I think um, when they saw the number was 20, the conversation started around, could we look at some of the eighth grade girls? I think there are some pretty strong eighth grade Pembroke girls um, in, the, in that program. In the sense okay. are there may be three or four families or, or maybe even five that would be interested in moving up. It's right. not for everyone. Right. Um, so there would be probably enough girls interested to um, support the high school program. Okay. Because it All is right. a commitment more than the eighth grade program, right? Right. right. So, okay. Uh, parents have to make that decision. Got it. All right. Thanks for clarifying. All right, with that, um, I'll accept a motion to approve the girls' basketball waiver for eighth graders to play at the high school level. So moved. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstain? The ayes have it. Thank you. So we've done some subcommittee work since the last time we met, which is always exciting. Um, policy subcommittee has a couple of things to um, put in front of the larger committee. So we met oh, Wednesday or so ago, whatever that was. Um, for the policy. Yep, yeah, for policy sub to talk about policy GBAA, which is sexual harassment. So in your packet, you have a copy of our current policy right from the policy manual on the website, as well as a copy of something entirely in red, which means it's new. Um, <laughs> So this is, the M, this is mostly the MASC sample for the policy. Um, we are suggesting that we 
kind of do away with what we have and go with the MASC sample. Um, again, this is just a first read to kind of get it on your, your radar, give you an opportunity to ask some higher level questions. Jess is happy to jump in if I miss anything. Any questions for Jess? I know David and I were yeah, we're at this meeting. Um, so, any thoughts? Kind of background reason, one of the reasons sure. why we're bringing it um, to you is that um, there was some changes to the Title IX federal um, regulations and laws in 2020 called the Final Amendment. Um, and so that affects both um, public schools and um, post secondary colleges. Sorry. Um, so, these changes are reflected in the policy and then as well in what we call our grievance procedures, which really outlines um, all the steps that we need to take. So some of the major changes um, in that final amendment of the Title IX um, that were implemented um, really is about procedures um, as well as protecting the alleged victim. So there is a lot more steps um, when there is a, a, a known allegation or a known um, possible um, infraction of sexual harassment. So um, it's about supporting the alleged victim, assuring that we put in what's called supportive measures for that person. Um, there's lots of steps that we take. Um, I am a Title IX coordinator, Michael Murphy as well. We've had to go through training, um, legal training on that as well. Um, and then notifying um, the potential uh, um, um, not just the victim, but in writing, um, but as well as the, um, the potential aggressor. Um, and then there's steps. So I have to assign an investigator. Um, there's lots of steps for that. So it's meeting with the, the alleged victim, taking their statement, meeting with the, um, with the potential um, person, the aggressor, going over steps with them, getting their side, putting everything in writing, looking for feedback, and then there is um, a document produced, which is kind of a, what's called a final report, and that goes to what's called a decision maker. So there's lots of roles now. Um, the decision maker cannot be me. I just follow, um, make assure that the procedures are in place. Um, Mary Beth has been assigned for the district to the decision maker oftentimes. <laughs> um, and so she looks at all of the evidence and we work off of preponderance of evidence. Um, and then there's a decision made and a recommendation, sometimes to the building principal, if it's a student to student case, sometimes to um, Superintendent Obi, if it's a personnel. Um, so again, the policy in and of itself has changed more to include the procedures and the steps that are now part of what's called a final amendment. Um, if you'd like to, the nitty gritty of all the steps that is in our grievance procedures. And again, these are requirements, but it does outline um, for anyone interested in, in the policy and then talks about what to do if you disagree or um, need to, are looking to appeal a decision in the end. So, in some again. of our dialogue with, with them was just They've gone through this a couple of times in a couple of different situations, and they've sort of worked through these policies to adjust to things that work, things that didn't work, and did they feel comfortable that these re reflected those challenges that they may have had in some of these situations to sort of encompass really what they feel is the best case for how this process should work, and, and this sort of reflects that, that some of their, not only just general policies that we were our best practices out in the industry, but what has worked for us and, and are they reflected in this, this document? And then they being our okay, team. Our team. Yep. And not, not MASC. No, no, our team, as, as we've gone through this in a couple situations internally, does this reflect, all right, well, we, this didn't work for us last time. Can we adjust and, and make it work? And, and so a lot of the procedures are outlined. So you have 10 days to do this. Right. Each person needs to receive the report in this amount of time. They have this amount of time to um, reflect and write a, a rebuttal or a response. Um, but we've gone through the, the process a couple times um, and have kind of tweaked our grievance procedure to assure that um, it's our practice along with regulations that are set forth. There's, there's not a lot of variability in what you can do no. and how you do it. Yeah. It's clearly defined with, within within the laws which they state yeah. at the front of the, mm -hmm. the, at the front and then reference at least the other agencies in the back. Yeah. Um, so there's not, a, there's not a lot, you, you can't say, oh, we're gonna create our own 
review process. Can you just, just so everybody's aware, can you talk to the <coughs> role of outside counsel within the investigation? Just because if you're listening to kind of the conversation, mm -hmm. it sounds like, oh, okay, it's it's exactly, it's everybody internal, maybe not, even though you went through training, may not be trained. Can you talk about the role of outside counsel, not only in the investigation, but in communications and kind of, because there's different paths this take. You mentioned student, you mentioned faculty member, right, because there's different combinations, faculty member to student, faculty, um, faculty or staff to faculty or staff. So there's all sorts of different variations. Just overview that, not take a long, long time, but just so some people may not have heard this part before. Sure, so we use our legal counsel to kind of check our thinking, per se, um, on our steps. So it might be reviewing a letter that we're going to issue or um, asking a question about uh, a request of either the victim um, or the alleged aggressor um, regarding you know, evidence to include um, and pieces like that. So we certainly involve them in a process um, as we go through. but. The regulations and laws are, are pretty, as you said, pretty clear on kind of the steps. Um, right. There's also an appeal process outlined. Um, whenever there's an appeal, we do involve our mm -hmm. legal counsel, um, as in most cases, whether it's a student or a staff member, they're represented by counsel as well, usually at that point. Um, so we, we do, we do move in. It's all highly confidential for the alleged victim, but also the alleged party correct, correct. and also witnesses along the correct. way because these are highly sensitive mm -hmm. situations. Any other questions? Yep. So in your packet you have GBA and then the um, grievance procedures that Jess just referenced while she was talking there and there as well for our first read. <clears throat> Um, the third thing in your packet for our first read is the revision to policy JIC-R, which is our anti-bullying anti regulations. So we do have a bullying and intervention bullying intervention plan that we are um, working through some revisions on right now with various stakeholders. We talked about that a little bit at Policy Sub. The only change to the policy is where the bullying and in intervention plan is located. So on the last page of um, our current policy, you'll see in red, we need to publicize where the policy, where the plan can be found, um, and that's the only change. We will bring you um, the bullying intervention plan when we've had a chance to gather all the feedback from various stakeholders. Um, but there's no; those changes don't change the policy at all. The only change to the policy is about publication and notification. Um, and we part of the plan is um, we do give you the plan in your packet and the updated form, but we are still gathering feedback. Any questions or um, thoughts on that? All right. I know we'll have more to come on that. We have gotten some. Um, so, you know, that effort of full transparency. There have been a couple of instances over the past few years where, and we have gone through the bullying um, intervention process and plan um, with students and families. Um, you know, if they are not in support of the outcome where the school lies, they are able to um, file a PQ. PRS. PRS. Got my PRS complaint with DESE, where then they review our process and plan. Um, I can tell you that we did have one come up, two come up this past spring. DESE has <clears throat> reviewed our plan, and the only finding was that it needs to be reviewed semi annually, and ours is from 2016. So, content, everything checks all the boxes and meets all the parameters. It was just a matter of um, <clears throat> making it a more living and breathing document. <coughs> So those are all first reads. Do we have to accept them as a first read? Yes. Do we have a motion to accept um, both as a first read? Uh, all three, the revision of policy GBAA sexual harassment, the Title IX grievance procedures, and the revisions to policy JICR anti-bullying regulations. So moved. We have a motion. Do we second. have a second? Second. Yep. We have a motion and a second. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstain? The ayes have it. Thank you. And then Ed Sub. So Ed Sub met this past Friday um, to take a look at our district accommodation plan, lovingly referred to as the DCAP. Um, this is a series of 
interventions that all of our students are eligible for um, in the general education setting. I, you can all read, so I'm not going to go through it page by page um, for you. We have this is not a new concept for us. We already have a DCAP. If you go on our website, you can see what we have for DCAP now. It is more just of like a list of what you can have. Um, this is more of a, a document that explains each of those interventions, explains kind of you know what's available to your student, um, what the methodology behind the tier one, tier two, and tier three interventions are. Um, we did get some feedback at Ed Sub, which I think we were able to incorporate most of it in there. Um, again, this is just for you all. It's not um, it's not a policy, but we do want to make sure that you're aware of what's out there as living, breathing documents. So we wanted to give you an opportunity to take a look at it and give us some feedback um, before we update our, the posting on our website. And one question Jess can jump into this. This is her baby. <laughs> as students become enrolled in the district, say at the kindergarten level, say it's a, 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 their first child entering the district. How, you, I, I'm thinking back on being probably a little more naive parent than I am still now, but how do we introduce this or make sure that those new parents um, know to even look for this? Right, so usually the first step in even having a, a DCAP conversation with a parent is some sort of referral at the building level. So at the elementary schools, it's ISD, so an instructional support team. So uh, the kindergarten teacher brings up a student to the, the team, and the team's made up of you know the folks that work with the student, administrators, uh, mental health professionals, other teaching staff. I'm going to talk through you know, what the, the problem is. They brainstorm solutions. They talk about, have you tried this? Have you tried that? Um, it, that's usually when the conversation kind of starts between the school and the family. Um, you know, if a student is coming to us out of a preschool and we have some sort of knowledge of the student, we might start the conversation a little bit earlier. But it's really a conversation that, that we generate with families. Uh, there's not a lot of parents that come to the table and be like, you know, what's your decap for my five-year-old? Right. Well, that, <laughs> it takes and getting to know of, the yeah. student to see, like, if there are any struggles. Um, you know, these, if you go through this, and this is some, one of my favorite things about education, a lot of it is explication of the obvious. It's really good teaching, right? So if you look at what the strategies are that are outlined here, that's what really good teaching looks like. So in most instances, a lot of this kids are already getting in their day-to-day -day classroom setting. Um, but for some of our, our students, there's, you know, a need to, to look at some additional interventions. Um, you know, one of the easiest things on here is the additional time for test taking, right? So that comes up a lot at the secondary level with our students, and that's, you know, all students um, with the with the, a need are, are eligible for, for that type of accommodation. So um, these type of plans um, are really kind of the, the base level plan in classroom interventions. As you go up in the tiers, you can see there are some more individualized um, and specialized interventions for students. Um, but, th but the focus is really for this this type of work to be happening in the classroom, you know, meeting every student where they're at every single day. Thank you. Um, and while this is obviously helpful for families to kind of understand what we do, and for, for me, and like Erin said, a baby, it's it's really exciting. We do a lot of this, but it's nice to obviously, as we talk about communication, sharing the good work that we do and the resources that are available um, to students when they do struggle. So we talk about tier one being all the things that Erin just talked about that happen every day in the general ed classroom for 80% of the kids. This one needs this accommodation, this one needs extra time, this one needs different seating, um, this is just good teaching practices. Um, oftentimes this happens at conferences. I just want to let you know these are the things I'm finding your child kind of needs to answer your question about kindergarten. That's often that first conference is, this is how your child's doing, but you know, these are some things I find helpful. I'm um, not sure if you notice them too. Um, and then for us, it's really a, a document for our teaching staff as well to know like these are good things to go to, okay, I'm struggling with this child prior to referral for ISP that I can try prior to bringing a child up um, as a concern. Let me make sure I'm doing and trying different strategies to see if they work prior to saying, like, I might need to move on to a level two with this student or a tier two. Um, so for us, it's it's kind of, you know, a great resource for teachers and for our ISD teams to talk about. This is what we have. This is what you can be doing. And it's okay to do these things. Sometimes we get teachers saying, oh, so I can give extra time or I'm allowed to give them the notes. Yes, you know, these, that's what you should be doing as part of um, in your room. About tier two being sometimes a smaller group or support in the room or a changing of a schedule to have a support class, um, and sometimes it has to happen outside. Um, and that's you know we talk about 10, maybe 20 percent of students and those kind of things. And then our
our tier is more intensive, more individualized, um, where the supports we have already put in place, um, the child isn't responding as we would like or as much progress as we would like. So for us, not only is it helpful for families, but it's a great working document for our teaching staff and our ISD, FSD, all of the secondary level ASD as well um, for our building level staff. But for me, it's a celebratory thing of like, look at all the great things we do have for, you know, we've worked really hard and we appreciate your support adding things like reading specialists. That is a tier two intervention that we can always um, do with a half-time reading specialist or the therapeutic um, labs at the elementary level, adding a teacher at the high school to compass. Those are tiered supports. Um, when we talk about uh, response to intervention kind of model um, being So if it, it's not something that you would traditionally approve, but I'm happy to give you some time with the document and bring it back just for maybe acknowledgement at a future meeting so that sure. we're all aware of the final, the final draft looks like. Great. Now, as this plan is together, does this help support some of the, potentially pull some of those extra costs that are going out from the earlier 14%? Is that? No. No. <laughs> That's just always going to be there. Yeah. No matter how much we add to the we so hope that with so interventions right. that there are supports so <coughs> at that, that tier two Thank level you. we haven't always had consistently or had the resources to be able to offer it to more students so with those resources and those levels of support we are able to provide some and students don't move on to a referral for special education so. Right, our students that are out and out of district placements, um, you know, for us, that's really a last resort, right? You know, our philosophy and our methodology is, is to keep kids engaged as part of this community for as long as we possibly can service them. Um, so there's not anything that's part of our DCAP plan that would be, you know, the, the reason why somebody would come back out of one of those placements. Those, um, you know, I'm happy to share with you someday the, the special education spreadsheet minus the names, and you can see how individualized the placements mm -hmm. are for students. They're, they're really specific. Yeah, and besides tier three being special education being a tier three um, intervention, this is a general education support plan. So it's really prior to special education. Like as Aaron said, there's lots of steps in the district with students with disabilities prior to saying they, they can no longer access Pembroke Public Schools. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. With that, we will move on to the superintendent's evaluation. So, so I had Natalie just add to the packet what you, what you sent earlier. Perfect. So um, this is a, I will summarize, I guess, your evaluation and then uh, committee members can add their input, please. Um, really, I just want to preface dialogue by, um, we obviously have just come through a uniquely challenging time in educational history, I would say. Um, and uh, I know Mike can attest to probably more so than I, being in the weeds far more than I was uh, through this process, but um, I think how you've helped navigate the district through these challenging pandemic times, uh, we want to commend uh, and, and acknowledge uh, your leadership to our district through that time. Um, it's, it's, uh, it was not an easy time. There were new challenges every day, and there continues to be uh, waves after the fact that we will continue to address right and we are with our uh, health and well-being component our social emotional component um, but we just want to acknowledge I know I want to acknowledge and I look forward to hearing others because they've been in this process with you longer uh, just the great work that you've done with your team and, and, and leading us through that um, it's not over yet but um, we appreciate the work that you've done and keeping our district afloat during that time uh, we focused on two different areas out of this out of the four standards can we just remind folks that by law you have to evaluate me in public I know it's super awkward yes. and people are like why are you doing this right now <laughs> it's part of the process they do have to do this in a public meeting um, as part of the regulation so so think of you at home if you had to have this <laughs> at your great, job and have great. your evaluation in front of everyone it's probably not an easy pack process. TV. <laughs> yes in front of a live audience and uh, taped yeah. at home so uh, again thank you it's a, it's a challenging role, and, and it's not for the faint of heart, shall we say. So we chose, as a school committee, to focus on two different standards, one being the, the standard two, management and operations, 
and then standard three, family and community engagement. Um, we felt that those bet best sort of met where we're at uh, as a district and, and um, we felt that both those areas covered all the, the goals that we have, our communication goal, our achievement goal, our social emotional health goal and wellness goal, and then our technology goals. We felt both those areas did. Just sort of summaries in, the, in those areas, um, when we look at the first group, we're talking about the environment um, and just how you and your team uh, have really spent the time. Obviously, we're dealing with some major health issues there and trying to get our facilities ready, use it, get our HVAC systems, getting our windows, all that process and that whole function and, and the great work that was done there. Um, so getting those systems in place. Uh, from a social emotional well-being component, obviously we've talked pretty at length about the, the steps done there, but just how you and the district have helped to put steps in place, not only as we were in the process when kids were at home, but then as we transitioned them in part-time and then as we transitioned them in full-time and just each one of those steps and how that that has taken place and then even now as we see how they're developing back to full-time students uh, and the processes that you put in there and we talked about the student health and safety so just how you continue to make that a priority how we have um, we followed state guidelines we followed local guidelines we've worked closely with the health department through that whole process and how the collaboration that you had as a district working with the different departments in the town to make sure that uh, we were making the best safe decisions for the families and for our students uh, in the work that you were doing there. Seems like it was a lifetime ago, but yesterday at the same it, time. It, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of both. So, um, and the great work that you did there, you oftentimes you were well ahead of the, the curve there as, as you and your team worked together to, re, to really make that happen. Uh, <coughs> then in, in human service, the human resource management and development indicator. So we talked about recruiting and hiring and how I know since I've been here, the, the, sub, or the, the working group that we had for social justice, we made some adjustments on verbiage that we had in our, to making sure we we're inclusive in our hiring process and how that all worked and really the recruiting and hiring and, and the type of individual that we wanted for our district to really match how that worked there and, and just the people we've been able to add there and, and the areas that we wanted to add. We talked about the, the supports with the paras for, for our lab areas now in the elementary schools. So really, where we're we putting our focus when it comes to recruiting and hiring and the great work there. And then the uh, induction, the PD, and the career growth, just how we celebrate and, and we put resources to developing our teachers so they have the supports they need to bring to their students every day. Uh, and it was highlighted that uh, we celebrated five teachers who obtained their professional teacher status and just how that reflects on our focus as a district and your focus as a leader to see our teachers grow and support their students and, and the, the positive that that is. Uh, scheduling and management, just providing time for our teachers to, to develop and grow. And then collaboration, I, I think it's evident here when you hear the three elementary school principals talk just of how they work together and, and how that culture doesn't come it by itself, it comes from the leadership that allows that to happen. And so we know that's reflective of the work that you do and, and your team and how you, you lead by example with collaboration. Uh, so we, we want to acknowledge that. Um, and then obviously you, you keep us, we talked about legally, right? <laughs> we have good counsel, uh, but making sure that the district is following the guidelines that we needed to. And that was during a time that there were a lot more guidelines put on us. So uh, the work, there was a lot of extra work there to make sure that we were abiding by that and, and we appreciate that. And then obviously, we talk about the budget process and, and hopefully Mike can attest more when uh, he speaks, but just each year as we, we are given a certain amount to work with to, to make sure that we provide the best education possible for our students, you really get to understand what are our needs and what are our wants and how do we make that work within the district. Uh, but not just for this year, but having the vision to see where we need to be in the next few years and then also make those decisions now, but for, for later as well. So just the great work there. So with that, I'll kind of stop on that, and I want my colleagues to hop in on this particular topic because uh, I know some of them have been with with you longer. But um, are we going ladies first, or do you want to? Uh, we're on. good to go. The, the Sue Squared usually jumps in right away, so yeah. we're going to let that end of the table for this. Well, bit. I'm honored to go first. I actually wish this was kind of live on TV. Um, Aaron, I, I would say to you when I first got on the committee about 
six years ago. Uh, oh, God, I can't believe I'm saying six years ago. Yeah, this is the end of my second term, which has uh, been interesting. Um, I wasn't sure what to expect. I had heard uh, some amazing things about you being a whiz with numbers and all these types of things. And I said, but I didn't know you. It was kind of funny. I, I never had that chance. I will tell you, and I look at this as your team, and I always said, if, if you treat your people well, they treat you well, is, is how it's always been. And to go through something as unprecedented as the pandemic with no playbook, with the rules changing every day, I look at what you, and, and again, you're the team captain and, and ladies, certainly, and to the um, faculty members and building principals, I was absolutely amazed. I am absolutely, as you said, I look at this, and this is all very nice and these little metrics and all these wonderful things we look at, but I think when you're looking at schools and education, people look at grades. And I would give this team an A from top to bottom. Did we make mistakes? Of course we did. We'd never been down that path before. Was your leadership exemplary? I, I absolutely incredible. Every little detail that we could come up with, whether it was how do we get lunches to kids or how do we, you know, get the kids to the lunches, anything we could do to make it work. And the thing that I, I give you full credit for is I know you're a mom. You've got two young sons and you've got to balance that, that home life. And, and having grown up with, a, I mentioned before, my dad was a principal and they said he had three loves. It was Malden High School, my mother and the kids. And our joke was we just never knew the order. Um, so I, I commend you and, and certainly said this stuff is all very important. But I think if you honestly look in the mirror and say, do we do the best? Are we good? Can we get better? I hope we can. But you're running the largest department in the town by far. Um, that's no knock against anyone else in town. Um, I am absolutely honored to be a colleague. I am honored to call you a friend of mine, and I've got to know you, again, so much better. But I want to thank you all publicly, and I think this town, um, is, you know, for the people here tonight, owe you guys a great deal of gratitude. They did not see the nights, the weekends, the crazy stuff, the emails, the phone calls. Um, and as I said, we've had our ups and downs. But on that, I will end it. But Aaron, thank you, and ladies, thank you. As you know, I've only been on the committee for a year, but I have to say, like, watching everything that you do is, like, I'm sort of blown away at the amount of work that you do. Um, like David says, you're, it's like you're on 100% of the time, even when you should be taking a day off, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think most people realize that. Like, there'll be Sundays, there's, like, crazy times when you should be with your family and you're still worried about the district. Um, another thing, I'm kind of blown away by really is your use of the budget the, and the way that you were able to take all of the CARES funds and, you know, the money that we had coming into the district um, because of the pandemic and be able to categorize that where it was needed most. And I think that takes a certain skill level that, you know, I feel like most other districts don't have that benefit. And I feel like I'm just really grateful that you were here to take care of all of it. Um, any ideas that I had before I was on the committee about what you did, it, like, my, like, I'm just completely blown away. It's like you do triple the amount I ever thought you did. And so um, thank you very much for all you do. I only have the one year to reference. I wasn't There'll here. There'll be many more. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't here through the pandemic, so I didn't, you know. You were here, though. You were on all those Zoom calls. I was watching every Zoom call. <laughs> yeah. She was there. And, um, you know, I was, all of you did an amazing job through all of it. You know, it, it, all of you were really, really amazing. So thank you so much. Susie? Um, a, a lot that I would say was already said, um, but I, I know, <laughs> but don't worry, I have commentary. Um, there, there were different things I noted, and again, the, the, the volume of hours, I, I think, Sue, you're, you're correct in that as you work with this team, you, you, you see the amount of teamwork, um, you also see the level of patience. Anybody that works with me has to be patient. Um, what you don't realize is a lot of times we are sending incredibly detailed questions um, to this team, and if one can't answer it, they're coordinating with one another to get an answer so that it can be addressed and then said, spoken publicly here in the meeting so that those that didn't think they had that question will hear the answer to it. Um, I, I also, the, the pandemic process, 
Um, I, I'm the daughter of a plumber and HVAC guy, so I have to say I really thoroughly enjoyed, as you would talk to that, <laughs> about certain HVAC stuff, my father would have been proud. Um, you know, but again, your patience, um, the, the number of meetings, calls, questions, and emails um, coming in, especially during the pandemic, I, I only have to, you know, I had about a year of sort of normal before it really got crazy, but the volume increased exponentially, and none of you um, really skipped a beat. You, you just continued to do it, and, and we're out a lot. You know, town meetings, meetings with the town manager, um, you know, having been in the finance world for a while, I especially love the spreadsheets mm -hmm. that kept track of what certain changes or requests would actually translate into an estimated dollars. Um, you know my favorite topic, unfunded or underfunded <laughs> mandates, and you even had a list for that to help me, especially when I came on board. The, these are important things, so, you know, and your poker face. Um, you kept a straight face even when our Zoom meeting was hacked <laughs> and, and there were some interesting things going on. That's the sign of a leader in not reacting but instead responding. So I thank you for that and, and uh, I'd like to say I won't continue to send you long emails with lots of questions, bullet pointed and peppering, but I, I can't because that's just how my DNA is wired. So I look forward to those Sunday nights I, at 10 o'clock. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I know, but I just want you to have something to read on Monday yeah, morning. Perfect. I don't want you to be bored, so it is what it is. Thank you, Sue. Yeah, just a couple of things real quick. I'm going to talk about some tactical things that I don't think people understood or knew. Um, if just on the, around the pandemic, and then I want to talk about a couple things overall, I think strategically. And I apologize for not being able to get all my comments in, and I'll talk about that whole problem a little bit later. But there were a couple things that happened where people don't realize that just because they never get the light of day for whatever reason. The measuring of classrooms when we knew we were going hybrid, right? You know, tape measure I don't think is part of the standard operating equipment for a <laughs> superintendent of schools, nor is dry hopping in your car and having to drive to a state distribution center to make sure that we had PPE available based upon what was being mandated. You know, there's a couple other things talking about when you talk about desirable place to work, Lance. I think to me, We've turned into that place where people would like to go, but a number of people who say, hey, I heard there's an opening in Pembroke, can I use it as a reference? I'm like, sure, use me as a reference. However, I know the pool is going to be pretty big. The thing to me when we, you know, when you look at the staff, the fact that you know, we have PHS graduates who actually teach in the district. I think when we started a school district back many years ago now, um, which does seem like yesterday, uh, I think that was one of the things that, you know, wow, that would be neat if it happened. And now it actually does does happen. And I think that means something to the kids. I know it means something to those people who are the teachers having known them. I think two other things to, to note that I don't know if everybody realizes. I don't think there is a meeting that Erin hasn't taken with a parent or a community group. I've joined her on I, on, on several, but I know there's more from there. You're not always going going to give people the answer they're looking for or want, but there was an answer. Again, you can't expect everybody to agree. It's just, it's not, unfortunately, it's not the way um, this works. But then on, on the budget, there's been a lot. I don't think people realize the organization and planning that goes into it when it starts, how it gets to the end, and how there's always a path or a plan, which goes to my, my bigger piece. When we, and I do mean we, literally everyone here was going through what happened, um, the question that Aaron and I got when we went to, in front of the select board during this past budget cycle, and then we went in front of advisory, got the same question a little bit different. What would you have done differently? Clearly there are things, and everybody can play Monday morning quarterback on this one. It's the easiest job out there and say, we should have done this, we should have done that. But when you, we went back and said, based upon the data we had, and everybody, it's so easy to say, oh, you had the wrong data at the time. Well, guess what? We had the data we did. Based upon that, there weren't major things we could have changed or would have changed based upon um, what we were mandated, based upon what we knew, right? The data we had now, if you could, if you could back test it and bring it forward, yeah, you would have done it different, but you wouldn't have done things different. And the two things, I know, because I know we talked about this back in, you know, March of 2020, because I remember getting the call, I could tell you where I was, what I was doing. The 
two things that were, were top of mind were how to keep the kids educated as much as you could because you were going into something you had never done before. And how do we maintain food security because those are the two biggest problems that the students had at that point. Um, and I could go into all the detail, which I did that night, but no. But with that, to me, what that showed is every decision, whether you believe it or not, had critical thinking behind it. And again, we can always go back and say we would have made a, a different decision. Everything in our lives we would have. But at the time, <coughs> I feel confident that everything that was brought to this committee was well thought out. And if there was question or hey did you think of this did you think of that it had it it got revised it was a collaboration and a discussion not I'm doing it this way and I'm right and I've had the privilege and pleasure of working with all three superintendents this district has had since we've been autonomous and I will tell you they all had different qualities different pros different cons but when you look at willingness to meet with the community and willing oh, willingness and openness to hearing at least what this committee has to say what the other town committees have to say and what the community has to say i can tell you that Aaron probably Aaron's the best of the three and i'm not saying i feel bad hopefully pat randall's not watching she does send a christmas card every year she's a wonderful person but when different you look time, at it time. it was a different time it's it's again not saying we always agree with the decision i you know, I can tell you I've worked down as long as she's been in the district. We disagreed, but we definitely have. <laughs> but in a, but in a, but in a good way, all for the better. And I and I respect that and that's what I think, you know, is is probably the biggest trait. Whether you like the decision or not, I'm not gonna debate that. But I can tell you guarantee that thought went into it. It wasn't just, you know what, I feel good about this, let's go. So that's what I have to say. So, <clears throat> so I'm a lot of things said. I think in, we're just very thankful to have you, and, and uh, we'll do a better job of trying to keep these evaluations on track. Perfect. Okay. So that we don't have to get so glowing and look back so far. So, no, but thank you, Aaron. Thank you. I'm appreciative of the time you all put in with your feedback. Um, though it has been a, a rough couple of years, it, it did fly by. Um, you know, I think when I first got hired, you all took a chance. I know, Mike, you were the only sitting committee member at the time. Um, but there was some concern that you know, hiring somebody with an MBA would create a, a situation where you were running the school district like a business. And I would just say that having the business side of it makes running the school district so much easier because I know that stuff. I don't, I don't need to spend time figuring that part out. It, it leaves the time and the, and the manpower and the bandwidth to do the things that are really important for kids. So I am appreciative that you all took a chance. Um, I think of Newburgh as my home, even though I, I don't live here. I spend probably a, a lot of hours. I spend a lot of hours here. Um, and I think, you know, much to the credit of, of Mary Beth, um, Jess, the principals that are here today, it starts with me, right? So I go to the games, I go to the concerts, I go to all of that, and then they go to all of that, right? So what you you have to be willing to do what you expect of the people um, that you work with. And I think that that type of community involvement really makes this job um, that much more beneficial and, and it, you know, it makes it easy to do. So thank you. We are blessed to have you. Thank you. With that, future meeting dates, I believe we've set that for the two weeks from now. Yeah. Hey, Lance, can I do a quick little shout out? Yes, Dave. I'm not sure who sent us the invitation, but we were invited oh, to that yeah. unified basketball. It was Kristen Kelly. She sent me a thank you note. If you have not gotten the chance to go see a unified basketball game. So they only have one game left. Yeah. Um, and it's next Tuesday, I think. I think it's the 8th. Um, but I will get you the date. It is by far. Please go. It was, I want to say it ended up 58-57. We lost to Silver Lake the day I was there. The gym was packed. The students... Was that? It's a high shot, a three pointer. Yeah. <laughs> but the gym was packed. The students were all in like costumes and Hawaiian shirts. And I said to somebody, that what I noticed, I mean, the kids were so cute. You know, one of the kids got knocked down and all the kids ran over. And I forget his name. I was like, oh, are you okay? You know, I'm thinking to myself, who would do that in a basketball game or whatever? I mean, that's absolutely crazy. And then the thing that I got the biggest kick out of was seeing all the parents sitting up in those stands and they're watching people cheer for their kids and play their game. 
And I, I tell you, I, I'm a bit of a softy, I think, at times. I, I almost cried at different points watching it, and I was excited. I mean, you kind of get in. There was, I want to say there was a kid named Carlos. I'm going to give him a shout-out. He had like six three-pointers. I mean, I think he was shooting the lights out. You can give him a varsity tryout. But sorry, I just had to put that out there. Mary Beth was there, Aaron, yep. um, and I think some of you made some of the other games. But if you get a chance, you know, even some of the people listening, if you're out there, Go see one of these games. We it, have it one will. more game. It's on November 8th at 3.30, and it's in the gym at the high school. So it is, it's great. If you can't put it on your calendar, it'll, it'll make you smile like nothing you've ever seen. So thank you for indulging me on that. Thank you, David, for that reminder. Uh, so if I'm correct, November 15th is our next meeting, and then December we decided on the 6th and the 13th, if I'm correct. Okay. Excellent. Can I just have one second? We're ready to adjourn, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, Oh. But not for a particular topic. Okay. Was there anyone uh, in our audience that wanted to share or had anything to discuss today? Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, Don Bryant on Don. Mountain Avenue, and uh, congratulations on your evaluation. I know, uh, I know it's well met <laughs> after all the discussions <laughs> going through the the last couple of years, uh, sort of. Person to person, those, those things were voiced to me at that time as well. Um, one of the things I'd like to, to put on the table tonight uh, so I can be informed and well as make maybe a, a suggestion or two is the uh, DEI working group that n now has been put together. Uh, and I'm not sure the status of that. Uh, I personally think it should be open meeting and the people that are on that committee should be publicly identified as being on the committee. Now, I'm, I'm aware that according to statute, law, whatever the case may be, that it doesn't have to be an open meeting in light of the fact that it's explicitly directed at the, at the superintendent for her advice. Uh, but that doesn't mean it can't be an open meeting. Uh, and in light of what we've gone through as a town, uh, where allowing this to be open discussion has helped us make some decisions, it would be important for me that that conversation not now go underground, particularly when it gets close to our children, because we all know what this involves, do we not? Uh, we, we know what's at stake, and the closer it gets to our kids, the more open it, it should get. So I was thinking that tonight maybe I could be uh, informed. I did, as you, maybe some of you know, I did have a list of the previous incarnation of who was actually on it. And uh, I, I, I published it. I put it out there. And uh, I, I, I got a lot of kickback against doing that as if I was, as I was accused of doxing people. Uh, well, this is not doxing people. If you want to affect their children, you don't get to do that in private, from my vantage point. You come above board, you say what you have to say, you put it on the table. I understand the need for trust, and it's always easier to talk about things in private. It sure is. But at certain points, you don't get that, you don't get that path because of what's at stake. So I thought I would ask the question whether or not this is going to be an open meeting to which people are uh, invited or certainly can, can view, understand, uh, and whether or not who is on the committee is going to be public knowledge. Sure, so I'm happy to answer the second part of the question and maybe you want to talk about the open meeting part. I have a microphone. Um, so we are absolutely um, planning on listing the folks that are um, part of the working group. You all did not, you, Don, did not out anybody from the first iteration of the group. Um, so we've presented publicly at least four times over the past calendar year to this committee about the work from the Social Justice Working Group, including okay. folks' names and mm -hmm. who's in what working group. All of those are pub public documents as soon as we present them here. They're also all found on our website. Um, at our last meeting, I did just let folks know that we would be putting their names out to, to see if anyone had a concern and there wasn't a concern. Okay, um, good. We have not had a great internet connection here at North for about 11 days now, um, but today it is uh, as steady as it has been, even though this meeting is not live because we don't have any internet. Um, but the intent is to, to put the names of the members on the, on, the, um, on the tab. So we have 13 parent and community members 
we have obviously myself, Mary Beth, and Jess, our five building principals, and a, a handful of, of some other staff, like our communities content supervisor, our world language content supervisor. But that list will be on the on the website. Good. Is it an open meeting? So, in its current format, it's not an open meeting. Um, I will say that most of the working group type work that we do at, at a school level isn't an open meeting you know we meet about report cards we, we meet about the science of reading like you heard mm -hmm. principal simmons talk about um i'm happy to hear your feedback if you think it should be an open meeting what i will um say is that the number of folks at the meeting is 13 18 it's 26 if everybody comes which in that format is, is a very difficult number to, to manage conversation. Um, I don't know how much work would happen if we made it an open meeting and, you know, because we, I've been on a few boards and a few committees here and I do believe anytime you have an open meeting that if public comment is a, is a big piece of it, right? And, and, you know, the purpose of having folks there is so that they can participate. Um, I would hate to call it an open meeting and have it feel less than open by not allowing other folks to participate. So I think you're, then you're talking about, you know, upwards of 30 people um, trying to, 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 to work. Um, you know, what we talked about is uh, we have our next meeting is, is tomorrow evening, um, you know, kind of dividing the, the group into smaller subgroups so that we can actually do some work because Susie was there. I see Maureen in the audience. She was also there. It's hard of that size to, to really, you know, there's a lot of conversation. Um, it, it is hard to, to really harness mm -hmm. the energy of the group towards work. There was more getting to know you kind of type conversations. I don't, you know, I think it was a really helpful first meeting, but I don't know that we did any actual, you know, work of the working group. So, um, really are there nice. notes or meeting minutes taken from those? We meetings? take notes. They're not official meet minutes because it wasn't a, a public meeting. We could post the notes if you think that would be helpful. Just for the sake of it, I know we strive hard for transparency, right, and, and right. to work, and if there's ways that we can communicate the information that's taking place and still have a, an atmosphere that's conducive to seeing work done, I know we're open to that, absolutely. Well, the, the, um, the atmosphere to get the work done shouldn't mean meeting in private. Um, it, it doesn't do that on any other committee that's, sure. that's and public. I, and I think what Erin, if I understand as she's sharing is, this this has been designated as, as more of a school group similar to the way she does with the other groups. And this right. one is unique. And I think you've, you've mentioned that, right? right. So, Right, and um, so anything that comes out of the group that I wanna move forward to you all, I move forward to you all, right? It's not, it's not an advisory group to the school committee, whereas I think right. some of the others are set up that that, that group in particular reports to, for lack of a better word, an elected board that has a public meeting. Anything from the group that we're working on or that has, you know, impacts under your purview, I would move forward to you and then it becomes, you know, a public record. There's not, I, there's you no know, policy work being well, there's sometimes, it, we, we've made some policy suggestions, that's how we made the change to the, um, the require hiring and recruitment policy that talks about diverse applicants. Um, those pieces come to you, obviously, anytime we're, we're looking towards anything that has a budget impact, we bring that to you. Um, and it's a work group, not a committee. Right? Correct. So it it, is is a, it says working group. Yeah. And I understand the difference that yeah. people who observe are not invited to participate. Uh, so I, I get the difference, yeah. but they can be observed by the public. So you've had working groups, hundreds of working groups over the years, right? In, you have different levels of interest. What I would say is I understand the balance between wanting to get the work done and then showing people what the output of the work is. Could you take at least at the initial stages the tact of a, a bi-monthly update, right? You're meeting, you're meeting twice a month anyway, so pick every other month and give them more formalized update on what each of the working groups is doing. That's one thing. Second, well, maybe it's even part of that, and I'm not, I'm thinking on the fly. I was not prepared to even discuss this, so. Um, but I'm just trying to think of best practices and trying to, because I understand the whole thing about a working group in corporate America, you would not, right? It would be the working group, and the working group would, would report out just because it's, I, I know you're saying just observing, but it, it sometimes gets tough to manage depending upon the group and depending upon in some cases, emotions come out and it could be something somebody says, depending upon the topic. 
So I understand that and I respect that and I respect the, what you're trying to get out of the group. Could you do, go with your bi-monthly update and I would say break it into three main categories and people are trying to, to at least need transparency and maybe it changes from here. But at least if you talk about what are the changes with regard to curriculum changes, what are the changes that impact budget and what are the changes that impact policy? Um, everything should somewhat fall into one of those three buckets and maybe if you add something else, you do. But at least that starts to give a bigger update and make it a more formalized update in writing so that's something you could share for people who aren't there and then see how that see how that works, right? Because you're, you're starting the whole thing over again. You're looking at a new structure, if I understand it correctly. Yes. And I don't you know, you know, in, so at the initial publish, right, goals, missions, objectives whatever you want to call it but then start November right January come out with some type of formalized report so that you at least show what the work of the group is and then you can get comment from people which is who aren't pretty in. much just, what the structure was last time because we brought it we brought it to uh, you all just about every other month you did. on an update but then it, it, it yeah. fell off because interest in the group fell off right. right if you have the same thing dynamic yeah. happen then it changes the way right. you Way you do things but at least at fine. least you're adding some level of transparency in trying to try and find middle middle ground of compromise at least to start i i get i get it and i know there's complications and it. it would be very interesting to me if at the town level we disbanded the dei committee and that some of those people actually moved to a private dei committee by another government entity. Uh, and all of a sudden, what the town said no to, if it goes into the schools, then it's not, it's not clear to us. Of course, I think some of us would say no to it in the schools, too. But if it's, it's, it's actually the same people, and I don't know, uh, that would be, that would be um, a very interesting kind of dynamic. And we got to be careful with it. Um, I, I propose it to you as a consideration. Sure. It's not going to all get done here. I understand that, but I'm, I'm putting it on the table. I'm, I'm for the closer it gets to the children, the more transparent it ought to be. That's just, that's just a rule of thumb and it's hard to talk about. I know it's hard to talk about. I don't want to make it easy to talk about in that in that sense because it is hard to talk about and emotions get high, things are hard to say. Uh, I, I get that, but that's one of the burdens of doing government and doing public business. Uh, we found the same on the public uh, DEI committee that some of those groups became very hard, and they divided up into four different groups, working groups. Then they had the major group. And so we were going to all kinds of meetings and working groups we just observed, mostly. Sometimes they let us yeah, interact. Um, but it became tough. And people were feeling that they were getting tracked and hassled a bit. Well, so be it. This is government work. And you put your opinions on the table, you put your views on the table, and then that's what we do, and you have the courage of your convictions. So I, I just commend these things to you. Won't get settled tonight. I'll, I'll put you. it on. Sure. Don, the only floor. other piece that I, that I want to just put out there, and, and we've talked about a little bit before, is that you know a group of volunteers is one thing. People that are hired to right. do a job is different, right? So right. I, I've been right. hired to do a job here. Right. Um, you know, in as Mike and, and the others alluded to my evaluation, I always want to hear what everyone's thinking mm -hmm. and I always try to make really thoughtful decisions. To me, this is just a, a tool in, in making, you know, helping to, to, to make decisions. Um, but I have a tremendous amount of faith in our educators and the folks that work here. Inclusion is not new to public education. That is the basis of public education. So though the, though the conversations are difficult, they have always been happening at the education table. Um, you know, sometimes they take a, a different spin, but inclusion has always been a subject of conversation. And you know, with the at the request of this committee, we included parents in that conversation in October of 2020 when the social justice working group started. But I assure you that these are not new conversations; that they have been happening. 
um, and you know we, we really this committee felt the need to have parents involved in the conversations this in this iteration of the working group it's parents and community members before it was just parents I think you all over the course of the past year have recognized that the community also has mm -hmm. um, you know some some value to add to the conversations when we're talking about diversity equity and inclusion when it, when it comes to public education but a, a group of folks have been hired and are paid to do this actual work here um, and you know, right. are, are looking for folks input um, I can assure you that I will post um, the list of the members of the committee tomorrow um, as soon as as our communication person is in but there is little to no overlap from the original DEI town working committee other than um, myself and there's one person on our group that was on the original because when we talk about diversity equity inclusion education it means a lot different than it did at the town and we just celebrated and I think it was a feel-good moment for everybody here when we talked about unified basketball anybody disagree with that <laughs> anybody that unified basketball is part of the inclusion activities within a public school district inclusion and inclusion classrooms have been in this district since my kids were in here all three of my kids sat in inclusion classrooms and are better people for it mm -hmm. so when we talk about it we can't just take a narrow view of it of what is going to support an argument or for for either side we have to look at the whole concept and how it applies to public education. So when we talk about inclusion, don't forget those kids who are playing unified basketball. Mm -hmm. Don't forget those kids who are in Best Buddies. Or, right, I had a great feel-good story from Marshfield, a kid that I'm pretty close with. Lost our homecoming uh, king to one of the special education inclusion students who won it, and it was a great moment that night. I'm not saying, saying that's the only thing, and I understand where your concerns are, but just don't take a narrow view saying that inclusion doesn't include that because that's a pretty part of our fabric as a community. And I think you'd find pretty widespread support for that. When we talk about equity, we have to talk about equity and opportunity. I think three people at this table will remember a hill that I died on with regard to a summer, I know that what they're laughing at, there was a summer program offered for students who were at risk. What, these, what the four principals spoke about earlier, right? And my big concern was, summer program we required parents to transport the child to the to get extra help so they wouldn't fall further behind my mm -hmm. concern and they'll tell you we spent probably 20 minutes 20 minutes of their lives they won't get back but i'm glad i spent it wasn't that long <laughs> making sure those students got transportation why because there only ended up being about four of them but they didn't have the opportunity to get to that program because single parent two parents working whatever the family situation was not my business not my our job here was to make sure that that child got equity in the opportunity to catch up mm -hmm. so when we talk about it we're not talking about at least i'm not talking about equity and outcome but we have to talk about equity and opportunity and not just looking at it in other ways so the only thing i would ask don is try to take a more broad approach to it because it is a broad subject. And if there are things within that broad subject that are concerning, I think then you bring them up. But looking at it and just immediately casting it without going into some of the components of it. I just thought it was ironic. That's why I interrupted Susie. With what David just said, and everybody felt great about it. And then two minutes later, we're talking, we're looking at it like it's a, a negative. And there are negatives to it. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie. I'm not there gonna, are. I'm not, and, I'm, and I think I've, when we've spoken, I've acknowledged that. Right? And I acknowledge where my concerns are, but making sure we have an inclusion classroom, right, to help both of the students, it, to me, is, is, a, is a win for the community. And I think knowing you enough, you would agree that that is the same sure. way. Sure. And I think my example that I said, and I don't know if you watched the meeting, but it was in August of 2021, um, or I'm sorry, June of 2021. Yes, I do remember. I can tell you where I was sitting. Okay, so the answer is yes. I'm on it. But the point, the point I'm trying to make, and then I'm going to stop. Sorry, is look at the look at the everything rather than just what some people are trying to make. Is that fair? Absolutely, absolutely. As long as we're agreed, and we know where this can go. Okay, and that that needs to be public. And it needs to have a public face to it. Don't that's that's all. 
Okay. Don't disagree. Right. Sorry. Sorry, Susan. No, it's okay. You kind of, um, I don't want to say stole my thunder, <laughs> but I, it, I, I just actually, done recently had a conversation of saying I don't want to see this group end up just focusing on sexual orientation and gender or color of skin. And we've had dialogue in these meetings about people with disabilities. Um, I've expressed a, a desire to have conversations with regard to obesity or food insecurity, any number of different things mm -hmm. that present challenges throughout the district um, for the very real fear that it will become only about a couple of things that right now nationwide are super hot buttons. And that's, that's, right. that's not the, that's not where, where me as the liaison want to see the dialogue focus only on. We're taught there to talk about everything, but right. we brought up, a, there was a, a lengthy conversation a couple of meetings ago with regard to folks with learning challenges. Um, I don't necessarily use the right terminology that's whatever the, the newest is, but um, parents spoke very openly about that. And that's a lot of what happens in these meetings. Um, and, right. and you know, we, we talk about more than just, um, I think what immediately comes to mind for folks and and that's very deliberate um, and we're we're pushing to continue with that to not let it narrow in the way that mike said so that's my kind of not nearly as articulate way of saying that i we i get it and i'm sure and you're well met i'm sure you're well met i uh i went to the abington school committee meeting <laughs> and there were a lot of pembroke people there of whatever side they were on and there's a reason they were there and that is for a conversation that got out of control, uh, where people felt they weren't being heard, where things were kept back, and we don't want to, we want don't want to go there. Um, clearly, uh, my hats off to the Abington School Committee, and they handled that evening very well, actually. Uh, but but um, that's where it can go. Uh, so you're aware, I'm aware, and um, just words to the wise all the way around, right? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Don. Yeah, um, Maureen. Good evening. I just want to take an opportunity on, on the wings of the evaluation to say, as a parent, thank you. I appreciate Aaron. Whenever I come to you, regardless of what it's about, you always give me your time and you listen to me. And, and I do appreciate your professionalism. And um, I recognize it. And thank you. Thank you. Sir, did you have something to share? Hi, folks. Jay Sweeney, uh, King's Terrace. And, you know, to Don's point, <clears throat> when you even hear the words nowadays, uh, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's a hot button topic that goes well beyond Pembroke. And it could be something as innocent as Mike was describing. Could be. But there's a lot of occasions throughout the country where it's much more than that. And I think that's what many of the parents in the town are a little bit afraid of. And so when you leave, when you, when you leave the, the talking about it and the meetings about it in the shadows, then you can create more distrust and animosity than maybe you thought you would. So I think the more open and more sunshine you can give this topic, I think it'll be uh, more acceptable to people if they know exactly what it is and to the level of which you're talking about when it comes to that particular subject. Thank, so you. thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Before we wrap things up, anyone else? Thank you, guys. I, Mike, just, you yeah, I, just need, I just need two minutes. And you know, and this is even tougher based upon that. And I, by the way, I agree with you. The more transparency, more information we share, the better off we all are across the town. And that's one of the things I think we've tried to do over the years. Um, uh, so I kind of go back to my first meeting on the Pembroke School Committee was June 2001 um, in this building which was under construction at the time. Kind of comes full circle. I sat next to a boil back then, Arthur. <laughs> now I get to sit next to David. Um, 
So, but, you know, and then it's funny because it was Joel Sugarman, Eileen Hutchinson, and Kevin McCray. I can remember the day as if it happened yesterday. Um, I think everybody's known I haven't been able to make as many meetings in the past two months. I think in the past two months I've missed more meetings in the past five years, if not more. Um, when I took this job, I took it to do my best. And if I couldn't do my best, I couldn't be here. Yeah, I wouldn't be here, I should say. And, man, this is tough for that not. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to step aside. And it's not because of anything bad, and I don't... It's not because of, so we can go back and you, don't please don't. <laughs> it's not because of anything bad. I've had a lot of positives in my life and because before rumors start of something bad is going on, no, it's actually very good and it's all broken in probably the past two days. This is, you're probably hearing before my kids are. Um, but I have to step aside because of some personal and professional things that have happened in my life, all positive, please. And I just, I'll say that one last time, it's all positive just because of those I, I can't serve to the level that I think I need to serve or the need that the people in Pembroke deserve. That's what I've done for the last 21 and a half years and if I can't do it to that level then I just can't do it. Um, so I just want to quickly to say a couple things and then I'm going to stop. I have to thank the people of Pembroke for kept putting me back here, allowing me um, to serve. It all times wasn't easy and a lot of times we say we get or we have to do things. I can tell you the large majority was I got to do this rather than I had to do this, and it was a pleasure. The students, the staff, everyone who I've come in contact with over these 20 years has made an impact. Um, all the people I've served with, man, it hasn't been as many as you'd think over that many years because <laughs> we haven't turned over. You know, some are very close friends and will always be close friends. Many of the people here tonight. Um, I do want to thank also the partners in town government over the years. I think of some of the people who have made this job easier because of partnership, and I hope that doesn't go away. I haven't seen it. Well, with this committee and other committees, it's been better. It's not as bad as it was when I started, but it's not where it needs to be where it was before. And the only way this town is going to get better is if we get back to, I'm not saying everybody agreeing, but having the conversation because that's what we need a lot more of is conversation figuring out what compromise looks like and that doesn't mean the middle it means making sure everybody understands and respects the other side this is more than i thought i was going to say but i got going after that other discussion um the last thing i want to thank and last thing i'll say is i have to thank my family um they've given up a lot for me to do this because i know everybody here sees two meetings a month they don't see the advisory meeting. Ask Marianne Smith. She had my youngest in a baby carrier multiple times in the building inspector's office watching so I could go up to the selectmen and beg for money for the district or I could go to advisory. My, they gave up a lot. My, my wife, my kids, Lisa, a lot of people here know them. Um, but they understood why. So I thank them. I thank all of you. I wish you the best. And, this isn't even official because I got to send this to the say. town clerk. So it's like I said, this is Ron. I did not expect to get emotional. But I'm just grateful somebody else scored a tears besides me. It's always me. I'm always a <laughs> I love it, and it's a testimony yeah. to how much you care about what you've done for all of us for over 20 years. And and now I'm going to choke up because you've been a terrific mentor to me, Mike, and to all of us. You are an inspiration to future volunteers in this community who make sacrifices on a daily basis, and I don't know how the hell you do all that you do and how you've done it this long. So now we're both crying. <laughs> I'm better now. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you. And I know we will have proper time to acknowledge Mike's uh, time with us. It's going to take a while to build a wing, so. Yeah. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I, this is, this listen, is all uh, very raw for us, but uh, we are. We are <laughs> the hat building. Hey. Hey. We are. It's being torn down. No, yeah. it's, you know what? We are happy. I, I'm sorry, I've got to say this, because you do this, you do this because you want to. Yeah. And you have to do it because you want to. It takes a lot of hours. It's, this is a great town to serve in. I mean, I have made lifelong friends doing this and everybody here will and you have to always think back to 
are we doing this best for the kids in the community? Because the kids are the next version of the community. And they're the next version of us. So there were people before us, there'll be people after us. So that's all I have to say, sorry. Took way more time than I wanted to. Thank you for your years of service. I, I can't thank you enough. I can't thank you enough for your mentorship and you know helping me through my first year and um, this town is much better for having you serve in it and we really appreciate everything you've done. Thank you. Thanks, Val. Well. All right. On that note motion to adjourn. <laughs> yeah, motion to adjourn. So moved. All those in favor, aye. 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 The ayes have it. Thank <laughs> you.